a forbidden tome in ancient ruins, whispers and incantations spoken by diabolic ritualists, runes and sigils drawn in blood, a cloud of smoke, an aura of anguish and death, powerful wings, a head of horns, and a voice devious and dark. These words and more evoke images of powerful, corrupt, and ambitious creatures brought forth from a void beyond the physical realms and past the edge of the unthinkable. Creatures capable of atrocities who lure the ambitious and power-hungry with promises of wishes, who gather devotions of fools, then feast on their souls and consign them to damnation. Creatures known across the plains of the multiverse as demons. Hey lore lovers, my name's Eric with the Lorebrarians YouTube channel, and today we'll be taking a study in depravity as we dive deep into the history and characteristics of demons across Magic the Gathering's multiverse. From their summoning and creation, to their physical attributes, to their traits and motivations, we'll analyze the similarities and differences in demon kind amongst the known planes. The marquee creature type for black mana, Demons have been present in the earliest days of magic in cards like Alpha's Lord of the Pit and Demonic Hordes. After a nearly 10 year hiatus from the game, due to cultural and social criticism, demons have once again returned to the multiverse and are present in many sets. Opposite the wide aligned angels that value duty, honor, and devotion, demons are the manifestation of black mana, and as such represent ambition, greed, power, and self-interest. Demons are powerful beings who seek only their own advancement. Across the multiverse, they are often seen being summoned by cultists, ritualists, and any others hoping to gain power. But demons are clever, often fooling lesser minds and forging contracts in which their summoner loses everything. Some demons have wings, some have horns, some are summoned to a plane, others are born into it fully formed from black mana. Despite these differences, all demons share an appetite for power and a devotion to none other than themselves. As with the other videos in my Study In series, I want to preface this by saying that this is by no means an exhaustive list where every demon printed is identified and meticulously dissected, nor is this a video that explores stories, characters, and events in detail significant enough to warrant their own videos. Rather, I want this to act as a general guide to demons, their presence in the multiverse, and their importance in the shaping of the planes. A reference point for you to seek out the finer details. I want to take a moment and give a huge thank you to the support I've received. We've just passed one year in the channel's lifetime and have hit 2,000 subscribers. I'm so grateful to the community we've been building. And if you're a fan of lore and storytelling, or if Magic the Gathering is dear to you, consider subscribing to the channel where lore videos are uploaded regularly. Alright, time to scour the forbidden texts, confront the diabolic, and learn the ancient incantations as we seek to understand demons. Let's dive in. Before we can learn from the wide array of demons dispersed across the multiverse, we must first uncover the nature of demons, what they are and where they come from. Questions that are not so easily answered. It seems that like the angel, demons are pure manifestations of mana, in this case black mana. They are not born but rather created for magic and a strong reservoir of black mana. They have neither true flesh or true form, their essence is purely magic. With such a deep connection to it, demons are the paragons of what black mana stands for and have access to its most powerful characteristics without the drawbacks. Power, success, the strength to make decisions deemed by others to be unethical. These allow demons to exert large spheres of influence around any area they reside. While many demons are formed from the interaction of mana ley lines and reservoirs on a plane, there are others that are intentionally brought into existence by those that seek to gain from their power. This is the act of summoning, and it's performed at all levels, from the driveling cultist to the most powerful of planeswalkers. Summoning a demon requires sufficient amounts of black mana, usually drawn by death and sacrifice, which we can see in the flavor text of Blood Soaked Altar and Demon of Catastrophes. With the right ritual and enough blood spilled, anyone can summon a demon, but only the powerful can truly control a demon, and even then not for very long. Typically, a demon will turn on its summoner, luring them in with lies and tempting contracts, then killing, enslaving, or delivering countless other atrocities upon them. That's typically why only fools summon demons, 
but a controlled demon can be a powerful ally indeed. Now this begs the question, where do summon demons come from? There isn't definitive information to support this topic, so it will rely on a little bit of speculation and theory. But throughout magic, there have been several references to a place known as the Abyss, the Void, or the Pit, many of them appearing on demonic cards from a multitude of different planes. The Abyss is thought by some to be a void between planes, or perhaps a plane in itself without worlds. It's speculated that the Abyss, Void, or Pit may indeed be a plane populated with the demons of the multiverse. We get several references to it in card titles like Lord of the Void, Lord of the Pit, and Reaper from the Abyss. The flavor text of other cards like Demonic Taskmaster mention the Pit or the Void as a location. Perhaps it's magic's equivalent of Hell, where demons and other vile creatures reside, waiting to be summoned. But that's just my theory, let me know your thoughts on the comments below. The demons of Dominaria share much of their physical characteristics with the rest of demonkind. They have large horns emerging from their heads and most, though not all, have wings used for flight. Some of the demons that stalk the shadows and prey on the weak or ambitious were created naturally from strong reserves of black mana, but there are still many that arrived on Dominaria due to the summons of a planeswalker or ritual of cultists. One of the most powerful demons is known as the Lord of the Pit a dangerous creature that was a match for even planeswalkers to control, and based on the flavor text, knew about the nature of planeswalking. The Lord of the Pit requires a near constant stream of sacrifices to keep it placated and few can deliver, which ultimately leads to the summoner's own death. A plane shifted version appeared in the time spiral set as Liege of the Pit, but there are also many lesser demons that have run rampant throughout Dominaria, destroying villages, slaughtering indiscriminately, and sowing discord. These demonic hordes don't have the individual strength to match a greater demon, but they can unite to devastating effect. Their chilling flavor text implies that they were created, but by whom we can only speculate. The planeswalkers Leshrac and Tevish Zat were known to summon retinues of demons to fulfill their whims, as they used their puppet, the necromancer Lim Dol, to wage war on Terrasier and Chandelar. Because the artificial plane of Phyrexia has such an intricately linked history with Dominaria, it's worth mentioning the demons that reside on this metal world. They are among the strongest and most critical beings within the machine hierarchy and reside in the sixth sphere. Made of sinew, metal, and glistening oil, they have been blessed by the father of machines himself to enact his will. The demon Gix, one of Yagmas' most trusted servants, was responsible for instigating the Brothers' War and confronted Urza Planeswalker several times as Phyrexia attempted to invade Dominaria. In the current age, the Cabal, a sinister crime syndicate based on Otaria, has succumbed to the influence of an extremely powerful demon. Where they once worshipped the Numena Kuber, he has been replaced by the demon lord Belzenlock, a crazed and vile demon and one of the four to which the Planeswalker Liliana Vess owed her life. After having fought in and lost the War of the Abyss, Belzenlock was trapped within for many centuries until a group of Cabal ritualists accidentally summoned him as they were performing a rite to bring forth their god. He quickly rose to power, took the mantle of godhood, and set about influencing the entire syndicate. But he didn't stop there. Belzenlock sought to rewrite history to add to his fame, claiming such titles as Lord of the Wastes, Doom of Fools, and Master of the Ebon Hand. Under his influence, the Cabal became increasingly ritualistic and demonic, and their power has spread across Dominaria. It wasn't until the events of the Dominaria set that Liliana Vess and Gideon Jura confronted the Demon Lord and slew him with the power of the Chain Veil and the Black Blade, freeing Liliana of one of her demons. But perhaps Belzenlock has merely returned to the Abyss, biding his time until another opportunity arises to gain what he believes is his. There may be no other place in the multiverse where demons are as common and influential than on the haunted moors and grim mountains of Innistrad. A world replete with vile and abhorrent creatures, Innistrad is a dark plain rich in reserves of black mana, which may be why demons are so prevalent here. They can often be seen gathering the souls of their victims, leading their devoted cultists, and doing battle with the angelic hosts of the plain. But demons were not always so abundant throughout Nistrad's history. Long ago, they were but myths and folktales. Village elders would recount to ensure the children were on good behavior, 
as the villages themselves were attacked by all manner of ghouls, vampires, and werewolves. In fact, humanity was nearly hunted to extinction until the planeswalker Soren Markov created the Archangel Abyssin to defend them from Innistrad's countless atrocities. She and the angels did their job well, but in the vacuum created by the dwindling number of horrors, demons made their grand emergence. The demons of Innistrad are pure manifestations of black mana that coalesce and emerge from a hot and wretched crag within the Gaia Reach mountain range known as the Ashmouth. The chasm of Ashmouth extends deep into the belly of the earth and has an unholy smog that permeates the area. But few know what truly lies within the chasm. It's believed that the Ashmouth is a demonic gateway, a portal leading to another realm or plane from which demons emerge to wreak havoc on Innistrad perhaps an allusion to the abyss or the pit. The demons of this plane are unique in two main respects. Firstly, although their physical essence can be broken down or destroyed, Innistrad's demons do not die. Rather, they dissipate into black mana that courses through the ley lines of the plane. Then, after weeks, months, or even years of convalescence, their essence gathers enough mana and they consolidate near the Ashmouth, once more taking on a physical nature but retaining all of their memories and personality from their previous form. This led to a power struggle between Avacyn and the demons that lasted many years, for the demons the angels slew would just appear once more. Their salvation came in the creation of the Hell Vault and the mystical power of silver. Rather than kill creatures that could not die, Avacyn and her host used silver collars to leash demons, then bind them in stasis within the Hell Vault. And thus, Avacyn's collar the symbol of her church was born, as well as her oath stating, what cannot be destroyed will be bound. Secondly, the demons of Innistrad have a deeper connection to the devils of the plane than most other demon races. In fact, the flavor text of Riot Devils tells us that the devils of Innistrad are the demons' unearthly desires made flesh, inferring that devils are the creation of demons. Demons, always seeking to add to their influence and ranks of devoted followers, use devils to enact their will across the plane. We can see this in the flavor text of Hellrider which states, Behind every devil's mayhem lurks a demon's scheme. Although demons are black aligned, their devil spawn are traditionally red aligned, representing the chaos and blind fury that stirs within a demon's soul. There are a few very powerful demons on Innistrad that have had a heavy hand in shaping its history. Grizzlebrand, although not the most powerful demon, was the most cunning and crafty. He used his skills in subterfuge, persuasion, and treachery to extend his reach further than other demons by cultivating a devoted following of human worshippers, priests and diabolists to enact his will, perform sacrifices, and feed his power. Over centuries, this network of cultists became known as the Skirstag, and they infiltrated the most senior ranks within the Church of Avacyn. Grizzlebrand was also the demon that challenged Avacyn to battle and nearly beat her outright. For four days they fought across the shadow of the Hell Vault until an exhausted Avacyn used all of her might to push Grizzlebrand into the Hell Vault. In a final act of desperation, the demon plunged his clawed arm into Avacyn's chest and dragged the angel along with him where they were both imprisoned in stasis. This could have been the end of both Grizzlebrand and Avacyn's story, if not for the fact that the demon was one of four demon lords who owned Liliana Vess's soul. A fact beautifully illustrated in the card Dark Petition. The necromancer used Thalia, guardian of Thraben, to destroy the Hell Vault so that she could end Grizzlebrand's life utterly. Consequently, this released all of the other demons that had been imprisoned over the centuries. With Grizzlebrand gone, a void existed at the top of Demonkind's unstated hierarchy, a void quickly filled by Ormondal, the profane prince. Also known as the Reaper, Ormondal escaped the angel's onslaught by retreating deep into the shadows beneath the cathedral of Westvale Abbey. From here he became the religious focus of the cult of Skirstag and uses his devoted to spread his influence across Innistrad. The most powerful demon on Innistrad, and perhaps in the entire multiverse, is none other than Withengar. Imprisoned for centuries by an unknown source within Elbrus the Binding Blade, Withengar was unleashed by Skirstag cultists who lured the famous demon hunter Saint Traft into a trap. 
They exchanged his sword for Elbrus, and as he slayed the Skirstag, their sacrifice broke the bonds on Withengar's prison, and the demon once more was free. His victory was short-lived, however, for after he killed St. Traft, his physical body was destroyed by a flight of angels. But as we discussed, this isn't the end of demons on Innistrad, and Withengar's essence bides its time, waiting for the opportune moment to coalesce into form. It's worth mentioning that demons weren't spared from the arrival of Emrakrol and the Eldrazi. They became twisted abominations and were bent to the Eldrazi Titan's will. It seems as though the nature of the Ashmouth itself changed, as the demons and devils that emerged took on Eldrazi characteristics. Unfortunately, Mindrack Demon is the only card that gives us insight into the fate of demonkind. Regardless of the future, demons have played an integral role on the plane of Innistrad, possessing helpless villagers, spreading lies and deceit through their devoted cultists, and challenging the superiority of the angels as they fight to sow discord across the plane. The Norse-inspired plain of Kaldheim, where Vikings raid, Valkyrie judge living and dead, and Skalds weave tales of glory and heroism, is actually split into ten distinct realms, each aligned with two colors of mana. The red and black realm of Immersturm is home to Kaldheim's demonic retinue, a boiling hellscape where toxic fumes blot out a dim sky and where the very water is set ablaze. Immersturm is in a constant state of conflict. Powerful demon Jarls lead lesser demons and hellish creatures into battle against one another for no purpose other than the sake of the battle. This endless conflict has molded Kaldheim's demons into exceptional warriors and raiders, with martial prowess to challenge even the most seasoned Valkyrie. Long ago, the realm of Immersturm was connected to the other nine, and demons were free to slaughter and pillage at their whim, until the old gods known as the Aenir created powerful magical objects that pushed the demons to Immersturm and sealed them off from the rest of Kaldheim. With no fresh blood to spill or spoils to be raided, the demons quickly turned on themselves to satisfy their bloodlust. They have remained locked in battle since. When the Scoti usurped power from the old gods, the objects that held Immersturm broke, but the new gods reinforced the seal with runic magic. They aren't as vigilant as their Aenir predecessors, however, and several demons have escaped through omen paths or doom scars, leaving a path of destruction across the realms. Kaldheim's demons are different than those we've discussed thus far in a few respects. Firstly, they are just as connected to red mana as they are to black, and this duality has created a race as cunning and ambitious as their black mana counterparts, combined with all of the reckless rage and frenzy of red mana. This has made them the paramount raiders and bloodletters of Kaldheim. Secondly, the nature of demonic summoning and creation are different here than on other planes. Rather than spontaneously coalescing from a reserve of black mana, or being summoned to the plane through ritual and sacrifice, the demons of Kaldheim are born from the blood crag. When a demon kills a non-demonic entity, the victim's blood is magically transported to the blood crag, at which point an ancient and mystical process unfolds, transforming the blood into a fully formed demon. Fortunately for the rest of the realms, the sealing of Immersturm has led to a marked decline in the creation of new demons. Unlike the plains of Innistrad and perhaps others, Kaldheim's demons can be slain and appear to die when their physical body is destroyed. Despite the nature of their creation, demons have still inspired occult worship on the other realms, specifically within the black-aligned Skella clan of Bredegard. Here, the human raiders worship and draw power from the demon Varagoth, who escaped Immersturm many years ago and led the Skella in wholesale slaughter against the other clans. Bredegard would have fallen if not for the intervention of the gods and the rebinding of Varagoth. Still, this terrible act is remembered to this day as the Blood Sky Massacre. Varagoth is currently the most powerful of the demon Jarls of Immersturm, but there does exist a demon more powerful. So powerful, in fact, that he instilled fear into the hearts of his own kind, driving them to cooperate with one another, gathering enough strength to fight him and seal him hundreds of meters below the surface. His name is Kardur, the Doom Scourge, and he threatens to break free from his shackles and level retribution on those who have wronged him. This is seen in the saga, Kardur's Vicious Return.
Leaving behind the plain of Vikings and Raiders, we come upon the plain of Samurai and Spirits, a plain where the physical realm is separated from and reveres the realm of the spirit, the plain of Kamigawa. Kami, the spirits of Kamigawa, are worshipped by the mortals of the plain and exist within all aspects of natural life. Some are nourishing and foster growth, others spark creativity or ingenuity, and yet others stir passion and cause destruction. Within this vast array of kami, there exist spirits so abhorrent, so twisted and evil, that they have become something else entirely. Oni, the demons of Kamigawa. The Oni are malevolent and chaotic spirits that were sealed away from the physical realm deep within the Sokenzan mountain range long ago. There they were worshipped by ogre cultists who sought to use the power of the Oni to bring destruction to their enemies. The eruption of the Kami War shattered the veil between physical and spiritual realms, and the ogre's centuries of blood rites and worship allowed the Oni to break free from their prison, free to bring terror to the world. The demons of Kamigawa are unique in that they are neither physical creatures nor black mana incarnate, but rather spirits that have been tainted and twisted by large surges of black mana. And if we look closely, we can see that all Oni, with the exception of Silent Blade Oni, share the creature type, Demon Spirit. Furthermore, all Oni have the hallmark third eye that sits high on their foreheads between the other two. The demons of Kamigawa are deeply connected to blood and ritual, and there are many instances of flavor text that hints at the spilling of blood. One of their most notable disciples was the ogre shaman, known as Heartless Hiritsugu, whose patron Oni was none other than the all-consuming Oni of Chaos, known as the most powerful of demon kind, and standing as opposition to Okagachi, the Kami of the Barrier. But during the Kami War, the all-consuming was effortlessly ripped apart by Okagachi's massive serpentine heads. Many humans and other mortals conducted rituals to attract Oni in order to gain from demonic power. Often, however, these rituals would end with an Oni possessing the body and even spirit of the supplicant, seen in the card Oni Possession. It's interesting to note that here, in Kamigawa, we may get another reference to the Abyss, the plane that is not a plane where demon kind across the multiverse are born. All we have to go off of is a name, in the card Kuro Pit Lord. Although it is likely in reference to Kamigawa's own version of Damnation, perhaps it is meant to tie the Oni to the greatest workings of the multiverse. The tranquil villages and rivers and cherry blossom bloom give way to the marvelous and breathtaking cityscape of Ravnica, where spires scrape the clouds and urban streets stretch beyond the horizon. Despite its dazzling surface and enticing markets, Ravnica hides a dark and dangerous underbelly where the most vile beings gather to conspire. The plane is ruled by a conglomeration of ten guilds, each with an alignment to two colors of mana, and each with a guild leader or parent that guides them. The demons of Ravnica and their ilk can be found within the red and black aligned guild called the Cult of Rakdos. The parent of the cult and its namesake is the ancient and powerful demon Rakdos to whom the cult devotes their worship, spectacles, and often lives. Older than the guild pact, Rakdos is the embodiment of the hedonistic chaos of red mana and the vile depravity of black mana. He is a jaded megalomaniac who sees himself as the most illustrious and superior being on the plane an idea that his cultist followers are happy to share. He wants nothing more than the attention he believes himself due. Creating extensive displays of power and influence to dazzle his followers, which has earned him the moniker Rakdos the Showstopper. His cult followers put on endless streams of circus performances, gruesome cavalcades, and deadly shows in an attempt to entertain or gain approval of their demon overlord. Rakdos is seldom seen, however, as he chooses to spend most of his time slumbering within a lava pool underneath Rick's Mahdi. The demons of Rakdos are anarchical and hedonistic like their master. It doesn't appear that they are summoned by ritual, rather they exist as material and independent beings. It's been rumored that all the demons of Ravnica are spawns created by Rakdos himself, and he does indeed claim dominion over all of demon kind. They are quite powerful creatures capable of mental domination, summoning demon fire, and commanding devils or cultists. Like all Rakdos, they are most adept at wreaking havoc, sowing discord, and putting on killer shows. 
Some demons of Ravnica have no allegiance to Rakdos or his cult, choosing to fulfill their own ambitions. We can see this in the cards Lord of the Void and Desecration Demon. It's rumored that some even sell their services to the secretive and invisible guild of House Demir. The plain of Zendikar is known for its rich reserves of primordial and raw mana, energy that invigorates the plain and all creatures that inhabit it. The demons of Zendikar are formed in areas where sufficient amounts of black mana are consolidated or amplified. Such places include fetid swamps and haunted burial grounds, or ancient catacombs. Since Zendikar's demons are black mana given physical form, they share its raw and powerful nature, making them quite deadly adversaries and even more dangerous masters. They often strike bargains with lesser beings blinded by ambition and extract their price in flesh and blood. Some are powerful enough to challenge Zendikar's angels in combat, as seen in the illustration and flavor text of Halo Hunter. It's said that the size and number of horns a demon has is indicative of both its age and its power. They spend much of their time consolidating said power and expanding their realm. The most notable demon on the plane is not a native of Zendikar, but rather a planeswalker trapped and bound to the plane. This demon is known as Obnixilus the Fallen. The demon was once a human called Obnixilus of the Black Oath, and he lived on a plane torn apart by constant warfare. In a gambit to seize ultimate power, Obnixilus performed rituals that summoned demons he hoped would secure his victory. Instead, they annihilated all life on the plane, leaving Obnixilus alone and igniting his planeswalker spark. During his travels, the planeswalker acquired the Chain Veil, an ancient artifact that could amplify its wielder's power. The Chain Veil was cursed, and instead of aiding him, it transformed him into a demon. Obnixilus traveled to Zendikar, where he hoped to harness its powerful mana and undo the curse that gripped him. Instead, the chaotic magic of the plane altered the spell and stripped him of his planeswalker spark. With so much of his power leached from him, Nixilus couldn't prevent Nahiri, self-appointed protector of Zendikar, from planting a stone hedron in his forehead, further stripping him of his power as well as his demonic wings. For centuries, Obnixilus studied the Hedrons and plotted to break free from his prison. He set countless plans into motion that were expedited amidst the confusion and destruction in the wake of the Eldrazi Titan's release. With his spark reignited, Obnixilus has become one of the most serious threats to the multiverse. And now it's time to discuss a few planes in which demons appear, but either in small numbers or without a significant impact on the history or story of the plane, beginning with the plane of Alara. Demons have existed on Alara since before the Sundering, when the plane split into five shards. They were the driving force of dark and vile creatures that overwhelmed the ancient kingdom of Vithia. The kingdom finally collapsed when Cedrus, its last king, succumbed to the lies and promises of power that demons whispered in his ear, betrayed his own people, and sacrificed them in order to gain the power of an undead lich. The demons of Alara exist on the blue, black, and red shard of Grixis, and act as lords to legions of undead. The most powerful of these demons was Malfagor, a dragon-demon hybrid of immense power, who battled and killed Bant's legendary angel Asha. Malfagor was in league with Nicol Bolas and led demons and armies of undead to wage war against Bant during the convergence of the shards. He was slain by Rafik and Elspeth Terrell. The demons of Amonkhet reside in the desolate wasteland beyond the protection of the Hekma in the ancient ruins of Ifnir. Many are slender with large wings and curved horns, giving them a striking likeness to their master, the elder dragon Nicol Bolas. It's believed by the people of Noctamun that the god pharaoh banished the demons to Ifnir long ago, when they had the audacity to rise against him in rebellion. Other demons known as Amit exist on the plane and share many characteristics with crocodiles. They are more bestial in nature and are often used by Bantu during the trials. The most powerful demon on Amonkhet was Razaketh, guardian to the gate of the afterlife and one of the four demons to which Liliana Vest contracted her soul. He was defeated during the Hour of Devastation by the combined efforts of the Gatewatch and Vess's undead hordes. Perhaps the most peculiar demons in the multiverse exist on the inventive and technologically advanced plane of Kaladesh. 
Like the angels of the plain, Kaladesh's demons are not born from mana or summoned with incantations. Rather, they are creatures artificially built by inventors. It's said that natural born demons existed long ago, but they have been extinct for centuries. The demons of today are thought to be made from the dark schematic, a blueprint and design that was originally created to replicate the construction of angels. The dark schematic instead gave birth to their mirror opposites. In the flavor text of Cruel Finality, we get yet another hint of the abyss that could connect all of demon kind. In the shadows and ancient ruins of the rogue plane Chandelar, whispers of a demonic entity swirl through the air, an entity called Zethrid. It isn't known whether Zethrid is itself a demon or another power altogether, but a cult exists that worship it in secret. Demons of Chandelar are called Zethrid demons in reference to this entity, and they broker contracts with the most ambitious and foolhardy of the plane. The demons deal in blood and souls. Those who wish for power must constantly sacrifice to keep their demon masters appeased, or else the power they so desperately crave is unleashed against them. The plane of Tarkir is home to two types of demons. The most ancient and more powerful of these are the tiger-like cat demons known as Rakshasa. Rakshasa have a mastery over death and the ability to foresee portents of the future. They are obsessed with wealth and power, frequently signing contracts and striking deals with those who would wish to use the Rakshasa's power to advance themselves. A Rakshasa speaks in sly riddles, whispering lies and falsehoods to lure the foolish into agreements with them, and an agreement with a Rakshasa is rarely mutually beneficial. These demons deal in secrets, and from the flavor text of Dark Deal, we see that the Khans of the nascent Sultai first approached Rakshasa to solidify their clan's claims. The other demons that exist on Tarkir are unique in appearance, having multiple sets of limbs and pairs of wings. It is said that they are born from the magic of the Rakshasa. The demons of the Greek-inspired plane of Theros dwell almost exclusively within the realm of the underworld. They are believed to be the souls of those long dead that have become twisted by pain and grief or consumed by hatred. Over time, the negative emotions within these souls fester and act as magnets, accumulating large reserves of black mana, quickly transforming them into demons. While most demons are trapped within the underworld, some are powerful enough to escape Erebos, wreaking havoc amongst the living, sowing discord, or feeding upon the desires and sins of mortals. A few of these demons are born directly from the starry realm of Nyx and bear the type Enchantment. From the Lord of the Pit in Alpha to the Immersturm Raiders of Kaldheim, from the spirit realm of Kamigawa to the underworld of Theros, we've explored the similarities, differences, and unique features of the demons of Magic the Gathering's multiverse. Many demons are formed of black mana. Some are summoned in a plume of oily smoke from the incantation of cultists, and yet others are works of artifice. Many demons deal in contracts of blood and demand sacrifice of flesh. They are devious, self-centered, and powerful, preying on mortals foolish enough to beseech them. They are a blight to the living, a dark stain that taints the hearts of other beings on many planes. They are both despised and revered, but regardless of what form they take, demons will always be there, lurking within the shadows, eager to deceive the ambitious with promises of power. Thanks for watching this video on the demons of Magic the Gathering. Leave a thumbs up if you liked the video and subscribe for weekly content. And now I want to hear from you. Let me know which race of demons is your favorite, your theories on the abyss or the pit, as well as suggestions for future videos in the comments below. Huge shout out to pianist, composer, and longtime friend Alex Joaquim for the intro and outro music. The references used can be found in the description below. Until next time, go forth and explore the lore.